let's move on to treatment. So we'll start a discussion first uh, talking about first-line therapy. And maybe, uh, the, maybe, Matt, you can start. The IWCLL um, guidelines came out. The last version was in 2008. My understanding is that there's a new version that's forthcoming very soon. Maybe you could just briefly review the indications to start treatment. What are we looking for? What, are the, what should be the triggers to start treatment? Sure. So, and, and this is fairly common uh, if you're familiar with indolent non-Hodgkin lymphomas. The criteria are similar, but a little bit different in CLL. So the IWCLL criteria, there's kind of three main groups that I kind of cluster these into, and those include patients who are developing cytopenias that are due to infiltration of the, the CLL into the bone marrow. Um, and there's different thresholds that we can use. Um, hemoglobin in the 10 to 11 range is where we start to think about treatment. Um, platelets in the 100 or less range. Uh, if patients are developing bulky lymphadenopathy that's either highly symptomatic or sometimes for cosmetic reasons, if it's in the neck, uh, patients may want treatment. Uh, and then the third reason that's often the most challenging is when patients are having symptoms that are being driven by CLL disease progression. And sometimes these can be vague constitutional symptoms. Uh, fatigue is often a common complaint, uh, which may sometimes be related to CLL, but may be related to other medical issues. Uh, so if fatigue alone is the presenting complaint, I usually look hard to find another cause if the CLL is not progressing. But in the context of progressive CLL, fatigue, unintentional weight loss, uh, night sweats, and these sorts of things can all be reasons to initiate treatment. Uh, more rarely, patients can have autoimmune cytopenias. Uh, we try to treat these with steroids or rituximab, but if they're refractory to those treatments, then sometimes uh, full-blown CLL therapy will be required. How about early treatment? Early treatment for anybody? 17P, for example? So this has been studied in a number of randomized trials over the years. Most of these have looked at chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy-based interventions for higher-risk patients, and these studies have all been negative in terms of an overall survival benefit for early intervention. Or not enrolled. Or not enrolled, <laughs> <laughs> true. Uh, there is an interesting ongoing study in Germany now, the CLL-12 study, looking at early intervention with ibrutinib, uh, but we don't have data back from that yet. So high not, Again, high-risk yeah. patients. And also high-risk patients, yeah. so I would not advocate early intervention yeah. outside of the IWCR credit. But an important question that hopefully will get answered with the studies. Yes. Yeah. One other uh, factor to indication for treatment is uh, a short lymphocyte doubling time. So when the absolute lymphocyte doubling time is less than six months, that could be an indication for treatment, even though it's kind of a soft criteria. Any white count, <laughs> any, any, any white count that you, usually Let's it doesn't happen that. in isolation. <laughs> That's been my experience. Is right. there any white blood cell count at which point patients need to start treatment? Uh, no. no. So, <laughs> so the absolute lymphocyte count itself is really not an indication to treat because a, CLL yeah, patient, yeah. which uh, the lymphocytes differently from acute leukemia, especially AML, uh, CLL patient who has a very high number of uh, white blood cells, actually nev almost, we almost never see leukostasis. I think that's the one thing we do have to caution. So I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, we, you're following the doubling time. But I think that there are different, everybody's tempo is different, and there are some people that may rapidly rise, but then plateau for a while and then rise again. So if you want to change the frequency of, of the visit because they are rapidly doubling, that's fine because you're going to try to catch them before they develop cytopenias. So we have to caution, I think, physicians not to just treat based on the white count or the doubling because there could be right. a change of tempo, and it, it may be okay. You just bring them in sooner to see what's going on. Right, and you also so. have to find out what's going on with the patient yep. otherwise. Right. For right. example, I often have patients who had a steroid injection for their arthritis, and then when <laughs> next visit, their white count may have uh, had a huge jump. But then if you follow them longer, it may go back to their previous baseline. So don't rush to go into treatment if it's solely based on white blood cells. One other nuance to that um, is that you know, if you decide you want to check fish testing at baseline diagnosis, that's great. Uh, but if a patient goes on observation for a period of time and then has a somewhat sudden change in the rapidity of the lymphocyte doubling time, it's important to repeat the fish testing before you start treatment because actually patients can undergo spontaneous clonal evolution to deletion 17P, and you need to know that before you start treatment. Mm -hmm. So frontline therapies um, become more complicated because there's a lot more options. There are different approaches that people can take, uh, that physicians can take, and patients also are developing their own opinions about what they want and how they want to be managed. So I think we're going to have some uh, relatively diverse opinions in, 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 in the next discussion. I think maybe we'll start, though, with something that probably we'll all agree on, um, and that is how to manage a previously untreated patient who has 17P deletion. I think there's less controversy in that topic, so maybe, Dr. Ma, you can comment on how one would manage a, a 17P who, a patient with 17P deletion who needs to be treated? Right. So we know from historical data from uh, chemoimmunotherapy, patients with 17P deletion really don't do very well. Uh, they 
either don't respond or if they respond, they have a very short duration response. But uh, with the new development of the BTK inhibitor, uh, currently we have available is ibrutinib. Um, so that has definitely shown that even patients with 17P deletion can equally benefit from the uh, ibrutinib therapy. So nowadays I think probably most of us would agree that um, for patients with 17P deletion, it's better to avoid immunochemotherapy because not only does it not help, it actually may induce more genetic changes which may make the disease more aggressive. So instead, those patients will be most suitable for novel kinase inhibitor therapy, such as ibrutinib. Is age an important feature when you're thinking about that patient with 17P that you're going to start on, on a, a BTK inhibitor? or? So age will be something, yes, whenever we start any treatment, we'll have to look at the patient as a whole. Their age, their comorbidities. So um, age itself is not a, uh, in a, for chemoimmunotherapy, age is a huge factor. But for uh, kinase inhibitors, age itself is really not an uh, important mm -hmm. factor, but it's more the comorbidities and their other medications, which will determine whether there's any contraindication uh, or increased risk for taking ibrutinib. Okay. So in terms of the non-17P deletion, uh, maybe we can start with you, Steve, and you can comment on what are the features and characteristics that you consider when you're considering first-line therapy for a patient? What's important, and um, how do you use that information in your approach? So again, to emphasize, if you, if you haven't tested uh, for prognostic reasons, this is the time to test. Uh, mutation status, re repeat the fish. Uh, in you know, many circumstances, uh, particularly, uh, as Matt mentioned, of a sudden change. So that's really important, because now we're talking about predictive factors in some cases. And then, of course, uh, you know, the fitness of the patient, however you want to measure that. I think we all can kind of tell after a few minutes talking to our patients uh, whether they tolerate a, a, a chemoimmunotherapy uh, regimen. And then, and then I think a really, really important point is what's your goal? What is your goal in that individual patient? Uh, you know, if you're starting therapy because somebody's 78 and they've got bulky neck adenopathy, um, and they may tell you, well, you know, I don't want to lose my hair, and that's their main goal. Um, and that's very different than how you might approach somebody who's 68 who's got cytopenias and bulky disease. So, so take all that information, decide what you want to achieve, because it's not one size fits all. But I think one really important issue is mutation status. Uh, it's clear repeatedly that chemoimmunotherapy regimens do not give prolonged a benefit in the uh, unmutated patient. Uh, and of all the tests that we do, that's the one that probably is done least often. I think you see a lot more fish testing, which is great. But so that's really, really important. Um, the kinase inhibitors work equally as well, whether you're mutated or unmutated, in contrast to chemoimmunotherapy. So if you're looking at a young patient, let's say, uh, that's really important because you might consider chemoimmunotherapy in a fit patient or at least have that conversation with them uh, if, they're, if they're mutated. Uh, whereas if they're unmutated, uh, perhaps well, right now we have a brutinib uh, commercially available. And in the older patients, uh, for tolerability reasons, you might easily just choose a brutinib. But again, we have obinutuzumab. If you want to use an antibody to shrink lymph nodes in an elderly person, that's your goal. Uh, and some people may still want to give bendamustine and rituximab uh, in select patients. So it, it sort of depends. But at least we have information to allow us to make choices. So f repeating fish and mutation status, those are the two lab tests that are most useful in directing uh, yeah, therapy definitely. and yeah. in considering the patient's uh, age and comorbidities. Yeah. I, I GHV mutation status, just to be clear. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. IGHV yes. mutation yep. status. Okay. Readily available yeah. tests. Yes. Uh, agreed. Yes. Yep. Agreed.